Okay, good afternoon. It's June the 25th, Saturday, 2011. And it's just around noon here in Altadena, scenic Altadena, California. Uh, I hope uh, you're ready for another exciting episode of Bill Bing's Trumpet Talk. Uh, today, uh, I was warming up for a few minutes and came up with a topic which I thought was very important and that is breathing because after all this is a wind driven device and uh, I uh, was thinking about all the different ways that uh, how to breathe on the trumpet have been uh, approached uh, for example Manny Klein and I just realized many of you may not realize who Manny Klein uh, was he was one of my mentors first of all I met him when I first came to Los Angeles and he kind of took me under his wing and was extremely kind to me I used to visit him once a week and it was like trumpet player heaven because all the great trumpet players from uh, really around the world would come and visit him he was uh, the top studio player here in Los Angeles for many years when he was uh, 16 years old he told me that uh, he was studying with Schlossberg and they uh, Schlossberg got a call from the Detroit Symphony wanting to know if he had a student who could play first trumpet and Schlossberg recommended Manny at the age of 16. But Manny already realized uh, that he was uh, much happier playing uh, Broadway shows and commercial music as well as uh, classical music. And indeed, that's what he ended up doing in New York, being one of the top uh, first uh, uh, top studio players uh, with the likes of Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey and Benny Goodman, who at that time, was, I guess, was still playing saxophone as well as clarinet. But in any case, uh, uh, Manny uh, said that uh, he asked Schlossberg would say about breathing. He said it's real simple. If you don't breathe, you'll die. So uh, that's one approach to breathing, which kind of simplifies it, doesn't it? Then you have the other approaches uh, to breathing, which are uh, much more complex, and uh, they run from uh, Claude Gordon used to have a series of breathing exercises that he would ask every student to do every day. And if you go to the Claude, Claude Gordon books, uh, I believe he talks about his uh, approach to breathing. Basically, uh, you would uh, go and take five steps. With each step, you'd inhale, keeping the chest up at all times. Then for five steps, you would hold. Five steps, you would exhale. And five steps, you would hold. And then you'd repeat the process and work your way up to uh, uh, six steps and seven steps, etc. And that was a good and effective way to get some control over your breathing. Uh, let's see, um, I wish I could think of some of the other approaches to breathing. Bobby Shu has a wonderful uh, way of teaching uh, breathing. He calls it the wedge breath or the shoe breath as it's sometimes known now. But uh, I think he first learned it from Maynard Ferguson. That's a four step uh, process and maybe sometime we can talk about that. But I think Bobby Shu is uh, all over the uh, YouTube uh, nation uh, here and uh, you can see him talking about it. I got interested more in Bob, Bobby Shue's teachings uh, when I was teaching at CSUN and I had a couple of students come in and their upper register was getting much better and I was thinking, oh, my teaching is really working. And then I found out that they had taken a couple of lessons with Bobby Shue and it seemed to be helping them a lot. So uh, sometimes it's better to join them than fight them. So I called Bobby up and asked for a couple of lessons and uh, he was very helpful and very kind with his time and a marvelous teacher. And uh, so we talked about the shoe breath. And uh, one of the interesting things about the shoe breath or the wedge breath to me is uh, part of that process is raising the shoulders. That's one of the steps. And I had been taught all along that that's not appropriate for a classical musician or a singer or whatever to raise the shoulders. But in that context, it works. So it's another one of those situations where you can't really assume anything is gospel until you've tried it. And then maybe doesn't work for you maybe it will work for you but uh, I like to keep my mind open because there's all opportunities to learn that way uh, then there's the time that I took uh, some lessons from Bob Karen because uh, I know he had studied with Arnold Jacobs and Arnold Jacobs uh, as most people know was the tuba player in the Chicago Symphony for many years and a, a really the probably the foremost uh, thinker on uh, breathing as applied to brass playing and he has a couple of books out and I think there's probably things all over the internet about uh, Arnold Jacobs approach as well so I took a few lessons with Bob Karen as he studied with the uh, Jacobs and uh, was able to glean from him one of the important things for me was to when I breathe not to make a sibilant sound don't go 
because that indicates restricted airflow. What you want to think more than anything else is to think of a TOH kind of a sound. He would, I think, explain it as uh, air, warm air going into a glass milk bottle and having that same sound as you exhale. And uh, that seemed to be very helpful for me. It also it reminded me uh, that uh, that would be, a, it showed me that's also a good thing to focus on when I was playing. Uh, sometimes my mind would wander, I'd start to get nervous, and I'd need something to, f to hang on to. And the breath was something that I could hang on to with good consistency. So when I would uh, be in a playing situation, rather than focus on everything that was going around, I'd try to focus on the breath. And that seemed to help focus where I needed the focus. And finally, I guess the uh, one other uh, situation that, uh, as far as uh, breathing goes, is uh, I did a study once uh, when I first came to Los Angeles on breathing as a, uh, applied to brass players. And I ran around with a spirometer, which is this device that measures inhalation, exhalation, I call it FE1, FE2, forced expiratory volume, uh, and uh, et cetera, and to try and do a scientific study of pulmonary function. Because I was concerned that I didn't have enough lung volume or inhalation, uh, vital capacity to uh, play the instrument well. And basically what I found was that most likely we all have plenty of uh, lung volume in order to play the trumpet well. It's really how we use it that's more important than anything else. One of the trumpet players who I uh, tested was this great trumpet high note artist named Bud Brisboy. Wonderful trumpet player, very nice fellow. And uh, Bud uh, took the test and he scored quite low as far as his, uh, his volume, lung volume and uh, maximal capacity and lung capacity. And uh, part of the reason was he explained to me that he had uh, this uh, bad asthma as a child. And I could relate to that because I also have asthma or had asthma. Don't have it so much anymore. But uh, in any case, uh, he uh, didn't score that high, but boy, he sure could play high notes. So again, it was just further proof of uh, you do have to breathe correctly you know, in such a way as not to inhibit the airflow or to cause restricted airflow, uh, but we all have enough uh, vital capacity to get the job done. So not much in the way of playing today, but hopefully a, a, a kind of a good cross-section of uh, approaches on uh, how to breathe and uh, apply it to the, uh, to the brass player. Thanks for uh, listening, and I hope you found this information helpful. Take care, and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.